so that the promises by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. But before faith came, we were kept in custody under the law, being shut up to the faith which was later to be revealed, that is Christ. Therefore, the law became our tutor to lead us to Christ that we may be justified by faith. Now, we've talked about the question of uh, why was that important, and I just want to follow up with these final verses here, verses 25 to 29, and uh, begin to ask the question, when does all this begin to apply to me, and how much sense does it really make? So, when does it begin with you and me? What relevancy does this and that and all of the other things have to do with me? Let's start in verse 25 and we'll finish out the passage. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. We are no longer under a law. Verse 26, this is really good. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Now used to, in years ago, I, I guess it was perhaps uh, just cultural tradition, but it was actually quite pointed, I think. And it, regardless of a denomination, but a number of not denominations, when you came to church, you would often refer to uh, people as, hey, hey, brother, or to your sister, hey, sister. Uh, they would oftentimes call the pastor, hello, brother. Why? Because for you are all sons of God. We're a family. And I think perhaps it became a little bit of a cultural thing, but it was a reminder that said, you know, we're family. Don't talk to your brother like that. Don't treat your sister like that. We've been freed from that. And so we are part of this family. For all of you, verse 27, for all of you were, who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself in Christ. Now, in verse 28, we have a very familiar passage and one I think misquoted personally. But uh, then, then if, if no one got it, if like someone was somewhere over there behind a rock eating Vienna sausage and crackers and missed the whole thing, he's getting ready to nail this on the door. If you don't get it, hear this. There is neither Jew nor Greek. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, the guy's hairs are coming off their head. You mean to say what? There is neither Jew nor Greek. You've got to understand, there's some Jews really ticked off. Really, really. But he says, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free man. There is neither male nor female. That gets confusing. For you are all one in Christ. I don't know if you are very familiar with the Moravian movement. Um, Count Nicholas von Zinzendorf or something. This is totally off the cuff. Uh, with the Moravian movement. Uh, you see a lot of their settlements in Pennsylvania, some in North Carolina and other places. The Moravians were one of the great mission movements uh, in days past. And it's interesting that today, every year, every year they have this celebration. And there in the Moravian graveyard, I don't care who you were. I don't care how much money you had, how many things you uh, worked towards and, and so forth, or however poor you may have been. Every believer, they have this little white square stone, white stone of some sort. Everybody, the same kind. No big ones, no little ones, no fancy ones. And, and they come every year and they polish that stone and they remind us. That, and the reason they do that is we, there are no gooders or batters. There's no greaters or lesser thans. We are all one in Christ at the foot of of the cross. So you go to see their cemeteries, you see nothing but a bunch of square blocks all over the place. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male or female, for we are all one in Christ. And finally in verse 29, and if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants, heirs according to the promise. Last promise, I promise. Um, you know, when I go through this, I, I inevitably come down to something I think to me uh, vitally important in that what, what does this mean? If I were in 
the church at Galatia and hearing this stuff and, and trying to figure out all this, this law and practice and stuff. And then this newfound spirit by faith coming to know Christ in a relational kind of way. It's all amazing. It's hard to grasp. So, first of all, I want to say in closing, um, and by closing, that doesn't mean I'm almost done. I'm just saying that. Okay. From the beginning, now this is so important when you understand this covenant thing. From the beginning, it was God who had a plan. You didn't figure this out. We're not smart enough to figure it out. But from the very beginning, God had a plan to have a relationship with you. From the beginning, God had a plan to have a relationship with you. You see, there is throughout the Bible, uh, beginning is, I'm sure, at Genesis 3 and 15 and maybe before, but surely from 3 and 15 forward, we have this scarlet thread of redemption, one has said um, and written a book about. And all through the scriptures, you see this thing coming about and, and God protecting that seed, God protecting that lineage. You know, and, and then at the end of Ruth, and uh, this is also off the cuff, so I don't get this right, I have to go back and look. But uh, uh, Boaz, they, they gave son to, birth to a son, he and Naomi, and his son was... Don't make me go back to that chapter in Ruth again. Obed. Obed became the father of... Jesse, and Jesse became the father of David, and through the David's lineage, guess who? There is a scarlet thread of redemption throughout the Old Testament. God had a plan, and He had you. He had you in mind. You're not an accident. I mean, there may be some days when we, never mind, there are kids in here, <laughs> Sometimes we think there are accidents that happen in our life, but there are no accidents. God doesn't make junk. He didn't waste His time with you. He made you and threw the mold away. And you can take that however you want, but you're unique. You're wonderfully and complex, or you're complex and wonderfully made, the psalmist said in one paraphrase. And that's usually what I say when we get in an argument. Not that we have ever gotten in an argument, my wife and I. But if we were, I would say, honey, you're just so complex and wonderfully made. I am totally overwhelmed by your complexity. <laughs> and I'd be biblical, wouldn't I? Yeah, uh, sure. And then after I picked myself up from the floor, I would <laughs> continue the quotation. <laughs> Have mercy, O oh Lord. And <laughs> that's something like that. So the scarlet thread of redemption all through the scripture and this relationship that God intended, we are not accident. You are not here today because you just sort of flopped into time or flop out of time. God is more in control of this mess than you and I will ever know. And we won't know. We still look through a darkened glass. We don't see everything, but one day we shall see him as he is. But we don't do that now. So we live by faith, living a life that is, that is from a different perspective. God has an eternal perspective. We can't comprehend eternity. I can't comprehend something that never ends. It's either always going. If something stops. We go to church, we come home. We go to sleep, hopefully we'll wake up. We start out, we come back. But when you think about eternity, there is no end. There is no end. And in that eternal plan, God had a redemptive purpose. And He had you and me in mind. In fact, if we were to go over to Romans, and I have this, just, just let me read it to you. Uh, and it's the second thing, that even, that God had such a plan that even in our lifestyles of sin and disobedience, even in the lifestyles of, of your disobedience to God, Christ died for you. Romans chapter 5 and verse 8. Even in our lifestyles of sin and disobedience, Christ died. God was at work before you were born. God was at work before you knew it. God was at work when you were at your worst. God was at work when you were at your lowest. God was at work when you thought it was all done. You wanted to give up. Life was over for you. Life had become more than a burden. 
It had broken the very spirit of your life. And even in those greatest and darkest times, God was already at work. And while we think perhaps we've sinned so much that God can never forgive us, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Over in Romans chapter 10, verses 4, 9 to 13, the Bible says, and this is going to pick up with the law a little bit again, and then we'll, we'll close, I promise. Christ ended, this is Romans chapter 10, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Verse 4, Christ ended the law. See, Paul's dishing this over to the book of Romans too. Christ ended the law so that everyone who believes in him may be right with God. That is the teaching of the faith that we are telling. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and if you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, you will be saved. Verse, uh, verse 10, we believe with our hearts, and we also were made right with God, and we declare with our mouths that we believe, and so we are saved. As the scripture says, anyone who trusts in him will never be disappointed. I'm going to come back to that word. The scripture says, anyone. Because there's no difference between those who are Jews and those who are not. He can't get off of that. He, he keeps coming back to that. And talking to a totally different audience. There's no difference between those who are Jews and those who are not. The same Lord is the Lord of all and gives many blessings to all who trust Him. As the scripture says, anyone who calls on the Lord will be saved. You know, I don't know about you, the, the question today was, has anyone ever broken a promise to you? I don't know if you kind of just thumped that around and didn't take it seriously, or, or maybe you, you did talk about it. But do you understand that that's probably the, one of the, not the number one, but I would say pretty much at the top of why relationships are broken, whether marriage relationships or just, where, just relationships in general? It's certainly true in the parental relationships. When mom or daddy, they promise, hey, well, we'll, we'll take you fishing. It never happens. Oh, we're going to take you to Disney World. It'll never happen. I'm going to take you to the park. Never happens. Never happens. I promise. I, I know I'll be late from work, but when I come home, we'll, we'll do it. It never happens. And what we don't know, we don't understand how that has engendered itself into the very fabric of that kid about promises or something you really hear about, but it never happens. Whereas the promise is something that God promised, and it has happened, it is happening, and it will happen. 